what is the longest animal? You might think it might that title might belong to the largest animal to ever live, the blue whale, but that's not true. There's another animal that supersedes this big blue boy's length. One of them is the lion's mane jellyfish. It's got a gigantic, beautiful bell, and it has long, long tentacles that trail behind it that fire nematocysts, little poisonous harpoons, or venomous, venomous harpoons that inject their prey with toxins, but nay, the longest animal on Earth, or so we think, we haven't studied every single animal on Earth, but so far we think they can get up to 55 meters long, 180 feet long, is this thing, which just looks like a big old pile of guts. But it's not a pile of guts. This is the bootlace worm, and when you see it in real life, as you may have on Twitter, it recently went viral, a video of the bootlace worm, it looked like venom, people were calling it. It looks like uh, some bootlaces, but in fact it is a worm, and it can get almost 200 feet long. Now, sources, when they're talking about the length of this creature, will point out that that's kind of misleading because it can stretch many times its uh, normal length. It's a stretchy, stretchy worm, but at 180 feet long, this would be, in fact, the, lo the longest known creature, and it's not just long. It's also Highly toxic, yay. When it is threatened, this worm will rub itself against itself, kind of like a hagfish, and produce copious amounts of mucus, which is reportedly uh, reported to smell like iron and raw sewage. Awesome. And that is a neurotoxic mucus, which is apparently very effective against crabs and cockroaches. Go figure. Right now, scientists are looking into the bootlaces worm mucus to see if it has some potential uh, insecticide, insecticidal properties. And it's all coming from this pile of guts. Interesting. Hello, and welcome to another Office Hours podcast. My door is wide open. Feel free to ask me any questions uh, that you have. You can uh, refer all the nerdy questions in the chat that I will be looking at, and my security team will be moderating, but I'm the administrator here at the facility, and as I have done throughout my uh, educational career, I want to give you the same opportunity to ask me, if I happen to know the answer, anything that you may want during office hours. If you put it in the chat, please do not spam. I will try to get to it as good as possible, and and we'll be hitting a number of topics today. We won't just be talking about worms, we'll also be talking about Godzilla and Godzilla's footprints because if you didn't see, we just uploaded a new video on the channel all about all about Godzilla and Magic the Gathering, which is very excited for me. Uh, it's exciting for me because uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a fan. We'll also be talking about Elon Musk, for better or worse. We'll also be talking about a little bit of climate change, just a little bit. And finally, we will close with 5G and the craziness that it is apparently causing. But before all that, of course, I want to talk to you. So right now, I am looking at the chat, and if you have a nerdy question for me, y'all let me know. What? Oh, sorry. You want me to look closer at the... Mon yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Here's a button. Here it is. There we go. Okay, so let's see what the chat is saying. Yes, it isn't a bootlace worm in my hair. That's a braid. We learn to do fun things during quarantine. And now I do have ambient background music. Uh, a number of you were complaining about the dead air, but let's get to what you're saying. Uh... Yeah, Gunstick says 5G, the new chemtrails. Yeah, we'll get to that. There's something about a conspiracy theory mindset or a, or a mind that wants to or seeks to um, shore up various conspiracy uh, theories and conspiratorial thinking that latches onto a certain kind of idea. And we'll, and we'll get to that. Uh, Aiden Perez says, what is your favorite color? Black. All black. Everything. Did someone say that once? I don't think so. How do I think light powers would work in real life? I have no idea, uh, says the Jump Kick Panda. You would have to emit some kind, well, you'd emit radiation, radiation in the form of visible light. Um, I mean, if you think about it, you do kind of have a light 
superpower right now, it's just you do not have the equipment, your eyeballs, to see it. If you could see in, sorry, if you could see in infrared, for example, you would be able to see the radiation that you're putting off of your body right now, about 100 watts, that's how the predator would see you. So right now you are emitting light with your light powers, but I, I know what you're talking about, more uh, Captain marvel -y and shooting photons out of your, out of your fingertips. Well, you could make yourself so hot that you turn into plasma, then, be sh then you'd be shooting a lot of light out. Uh, doing outstanding, one of our patrons, uh, if you want to join the facility, of course. Look, it's not just these podcasts, it's not just the videos. We have an entire community of, I think, over a thousand nerds now that talk with me every day on Discord, on Patreon, get behind-the-scenes access. Uh, to me, we talk to each other, it's great. They give me episode suggestions, a few of which are coming out in the next few weeks. Um, you can go to patreon.com slash kylehill and sign up. But one of our um, original patrons, Doing Outstanding, says... Uh, what what new cards are you excited about uh, to build around for Commander from Ikoria, uh, the new Magic set? And since the latest episode was sponsored by Magic, Ga Magic the Gathering, I might just go ahead and say, uh, Calamax. I want Calamax. He is a Stegosaurus with lightning spikes and he copies instant spells on everyone's turn. That sounds s a spicy, especially when you put Court of Calling and Kiki Jiki and Pestermite into play. Oh, 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 okay. Let's keep going. Uh, Batman or Superman? Batman for the brain, Superman for the powers. When you find out that she is a he says, cheese. Wow. You took your shot in the limelight and it totally paid off, didn't it? So Stachio, uh, Stachio asks about siphonophores, and I'm, I'm, I don't know about the recent um, discoveries in regards to siphonophores, but um, if you're not familiar, siphonophores are incredible creatures in that they are uh, collective animals. They are creatures made up of individual creatures latched together. So much like your cells when you were born, or when you were developing, um, differentiated from undifferentiated stem cells into different cells that would do different things in your body. Some would become your stomach lining, some would become uh, your bony bones, your brain, that kind of thing. Similar to, similar to that, siphonophores, instead of cells doing different things, they have little creatures, full multicellular creatures doing those different things. So uh, in, the, in the part of the siphonophore that, uses, uh, that uh, propels the animal, it's just little animals with their little swimmy fins. They're cilia and flagella and, and whatever. So there's a separate group of animals within the organism that do that. So it's like, uh, it's like microscopic made macroscopic and it's absolutely fascinating. And, and some of the creatures as a part of the collective animal do all the digesting and it's, it's really, really interesting. I, I, would, I would check it out. Uh, Michael Skinner says, no, not li uh, like a jellyfish. No, a jellyfish is not a siphonophore, but a Portuguese man of war. I'm a professional, but a Portuguese man of war is. Um, and they are absolutely gorgeous and deadly, and they inflate their heads to float on the waves. <laughs> I wonder if uh, other siphonophores don't like the Portuguese man of war, and they're like, hey, he's just full of hot air. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Um,. Rob Burgess, uh, I recognize that name, asked, Kyle, if you were the operator of a simulation, uh, but you were in charge, if you were in charge of a simulation, but you could change one thing, what would it be? Uh, I would, I would, this is off the top of my head, it's probably not the best answer, but I would remove the part of human psychology that thinks everyone is watching us at all times and uh, thinks that whatever we do is super important in every social situation. I think so much time and effort and energy is lost to caring about what everyone else thinks in every single moment. I don't know if you're like me, but if you're, if you're hyper anxious sometimes in social situations, you can fall into this hole where you're like, well, if I do anything, if I, if I crack my knuckles wrong, if I shift my feet wrong, everyone in the store is gonna look at me and they're gonna think I'm dumb. I want to remove that part from human psychology, but I can't, so you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, the Kiru asks, would it be possible to levitate with magnetic fields? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you want to levitate like the frog, you may have seen levitating um, in, a, in a super powerful magnetic field, you would need hyper, hyper strong 
magnets. So you would need multi-multi-Tesla magnets. And this would probably mess you up. To give you an idea of just how dangerous or, or weird, uh, weirdly dangerous, like scary, like, oh, I didn't know that could happen with magnets. So there have there've been uh, tests on highly, uh, on really, really powerful experimental MRI machines, magnetic res nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machines like they use in hospitals. And some of them are so strong, like seven or eight Tesla, that you ha uh, the, the doctor has to walk with the patient to the MRI very slowly on purpose. Why? Because human blood is conductive and it's moving around your body. When you move around conductive materials in a magnetic field, it can create an electrical field in response. If you were to run towards one of these MRIs, it would generate an electric field inside of your blood and you would feel tingly and your muscles might go and you might pass out. In fact, patients have reported this, feeling dizzy, feeling uh, lightheaded, and the doctors have to like physically support them because they're walking too quickly towards it. And they taste metal in their mouths. Isn't that crazy? So you'd have to, something, like 10 or 100 times stronger than that to lift you off the ground. But you can use clever things um, hoverboard wise to levitate. Um, I've even done it in one of my first videos uh, ever in my life. I got to ride on a hoverboard and what that does is uses a conductive surface, copper, and it spins magnets above it inside the hoverboard. This creates an opposing uh, magnetic field and these repel and you can float. So yes, hoverboard technology is possible. So now let's, I wanna, I know, I know we're having fun here, but let's move on to our next topic. So, Godzilla. We just uploaded a video at the facility all about Godzilla and Godzilla science. Um, I, I would uh, encourage you to check that out if you have not checked it out already. Uh, because we work with Magic the Gathering, it's my favorite game in the world, I'm very happy with the video, the animations are fantastic, I mean, the projections inside the facility are fantastic, and we even added a whole new wing to the facility. Do you want to see it? Okay, fine, let's see it. Oh, you're dang right! Oh, we are in a giant giant atrium. As you can see, this is my megafauna menagerie. It's where I have uh, all of my experiments with all of our giant-ish creatures when I get to them. And I love it. I love it in here. You can do so many cool things in here. You can, uh, from uh, all, the, all the stats and biology on, on our screen to, you know, observing the megafauna in the background. That's Lola, by the way. She loves spam. And she's a, she's a good girl. She's a good girl. Uh, but today we got to go to our Megafauna Menagerie and talk about Godzilla. And one of the cool things, I think, was um, what I hadn't done before. I worked with my friend, uh, Dr. John Hutchinson, who's an incredibly smart guy. And we've done a number of episodes in the past. For example, how to fight a Tyrannosaurus Rex, how to fight a Velociraptor. A lot of very, very cool stuff. And uh, he and I were able to come up with using... Uh, a lot of empirical relationships. So if you don't know, an empirical relationship is something you consistently find in the data that could give you like an equation, for example, but it's not necessarily a law. So this is something you just find like, oh, there's a scaling law that says, based on this power relationship, most animals with mass X size eat about X many calories. So what we were doing was uh, taking those kinds of relationships for large creatures. And yeah, I look giant, I'm a big guy. And we were applying those to Godzilla. And Godzilla, even at its smallest, is so much heavier, so much more mass than any known creature on the planet. Uh, the scaling relationships get ridiculous. So in the episode, we were able to talk about uh, how much space it would need to roam, like the entire planet, if it was a creature, like a, a carnivorous creature, like a lion that needed space to roam, how many, uh, how much it would have to eat, like, 38 years worth of food for you every day. Absolutely ridiculous. So if you haven't seen the new part of the facility, if you haven't watched the episode, please go watch that. But uh, let's go talk about some Godzilla, huh? So what, so what I've always liked about Godzilla is the impact, obviously, it has in the environment. It's, it's this giant, giant crew. I gotta, kinda got like a wild man thing going on here. Anyway, so if you look at 
uh, stuff like this. I every Godzilla movie opens like this, right? They they have scientists looking at, wow, look how big it must be. I'm a scientist, and I'm Matthew Roderick, and I study worms. We'll forget about that one. But you have these incredible impressions on the environment, and what's always interesting to me is, is this accurate? Like, would a creature uh, have this kind of impression? So we, we look at the scale, and we can see a ladder. So you know it's pressed into the soil quite a bit. It looks like kind of wettish soil. You have humans standing here and here, so we can get an idea of how big this footprint is. Now, I did the math on this, and you can do the math on this too. So you take the... I averaged the surface area of this. I considered it like a giant rectangle, which is leaving out some of this space between the toes, but hey, we're estimating. So when you do that, you get a surface area. So how much force will be pressing on that surface area? What I did was take Godzilla's smallest mass, which we did in the video that published just a few minutes ago. You multiply that by acceleration due to gravity on Earth's surface and you get a weight force, okay? So you divide this weight force by the surface area that we estimate based on the size of the people and the soil and stuff. And I got six million newtons of force per square meter. Six megapascals. Uh, this is higher, mind you, than the amount of pressure it would take to explode Godzilla's knees on the ground. Anyway, you can watch that in the video. But we look again at this picture. Now we ask ourselves, how would that make sense? Okay, so the soil is being pressed out of the way. So in engineering terms, this would be uh, overcoming the compressive strength of the material because you have to press it down and out of the way, right? Okay, so six megapascals in a vacuum, that means nothing. So now we have to go to our engineering texts or, or numbers you can find in the literature and say, okay, well, what's the compressive strength of soil? And for uncompacted soil like this, you find compressive strengths in the hundreds of kilopascals, which means it's 60 times less than this value here. Which, I mean, we're being very estimating here. But this means that this is possible. Something so heavy, putting so much pressure on a small area, so much force on a small area, rather, it's so much pressure that it could force some soil out of the way and could probably make a pretty dang impressive impression. Impressive impressions. So now let's, uh, I want to see what the chat is up to. Uh, Michael Koenig asked, Kyle, do you have an oxygen destroyer on hand in case they break out? In the latest Godzilla film, there was an oxygen bomb that destroyed the oxygen, and I have no idea what that means, or what it would do. And why didn't it do anything? Anyway. Uh, seven, uh, 710th Century Digital Boy says, That's right next to a road, Kyle. It's not uncompacted at all. <laughs> okay, someone's an engineer. Yes, okay, sure, yes. You would compact the soil around a road because you wouldn't want the, uh, the, the, the gravel and uh, what you're putting down to support the road itself to move out of the way as uh, the repeated dead and live loads from the cars pr passed over it, so it's not uncompacted. But it, the numbers are similar. But, wow, you just took me back to college there for a second. What else do we got? Uh, is the ambient noise in the background enough to cover the dead air? I also have a fan on me. It's under the desk. It's hot in here. Is the ambient noise enough? Am I, am I, uh, let's take a little, little sec just to check on the stream. Uh, Arne Weiss asks, what about Jormungandr? So Jormungandr is a megafauna in the new, well, it's an ancient legend, it's a Norse legend of, a, of the world snake. A snake so big that uh, its body could encircle the, the, the earth, or at least Midgard, or parts of Midgard, or the all of, it's a legend. But uh, Jormungandr is a megafauna, which I did do some math on once, and I did pitch the people at Santa Monica Studios a video about Jormungandr. We didn't actually do it, but we were talking about it. 
Um, and Jormungandr is so voluminous that yes, if it was to raise its body out of that Lake of the Nine when you're playing God of War on the PS4, which is one of the best games of this generation, surely, uh, that it would lower the water that significantly. So pretty accurate for a God of War game. Uh, let's see, let's see. Ambient noise is fine, fantastic. Uh, Jack Kern asks, what kind of music do you like? Well, when I am writing episodes of The Facility, um, which I do in excruciating detail, you can see them in the behind the scenes posts I put up on Patreon and stuff, but uh, excruciating tiny detail. And um, when I'm writing, I'm either listening to synthwave mixes on YouTube or uh, great jazz albums on, on YouTube. Uh, lately, I've been into, well, for a while, a couple months, I've been into uh, uh, Hiromi, just one word, Hiromi, who is a virtuoso uh, jazz pianist, and she is unbelievable. Bill Evans, a uh, classic. He played the piano on Kind of Blue. Um, he's phenomenal. And then just any synthwave stuff. I just, something monotonous and where I don't have to think and I can just focus on writing. Okay, uh... Hi Tooth asks, Kale, are you planning to complete college? I, I did, twice. So if you're unfamiliar with me or my background, I have a... I have a bachelor's of science degree in civil and environmental engineering, and I also have a master's degree in science communication. Uh, if you mean, will I go back for a PhD? No, probably not. Uh, two reasons. It takes a lot of time, and I would have to take, what, four, four years off of my livelihood and, and other things that I want to do to get a basically what, in effect, would just be a title for me. I can still do the same kinds of things without a PhD, though not all things, that's very true. But, uh... I, PhDs are, I believe, and I know I know a number of PhDs, uh, a number of my friends, and uh, I think I think it's more if you really want to teach and do research. And when I was in college and I started doing science communication on the side, and then I fell headlong into it, I realized that I liked trying to get people excited about and interested in our universe more than actually doing the research myself. I, I worked in a lab. I worked as a scientist for a little bit. And it was great, but I, I do like, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I like getting out in front of people and, and trying to be entertaining and enthusiastic. That's that's kind of what I'm gonna do. So I probably won't do a PhD, but if I had to go back and do one, I'd probably go back and do physics. It's physics. It's everything, baby. Uh, Toya Todoroki asked, did you get your degree from the University of Asgard? No, actually, uh, my brother, Loki, great guy, great guy. Um, on my ninth birthday, he, uh, he's, he summoned an illusion of a degree and I was, I was so happy because he knows I love degrees and then it uh, evaporated before my very eyes. And then he was killed by that big purple eggplant guy. Four twenty was apparently uh, Elon Musk Day. Unofficially, officially, um, there were a lot of people uh, in the Tesla community and uh, and such that uh, were saying that four twenty is Elon Musk Day. Hey, and if you don't know, uh, I did a show all about Elon Musk, and I don't have too much to say about this, other than Elon Musk gets a lot of heat. I, as he should, if he, if he puts himself out that much into the public eye, you know, you should be held accountable when you have such an immense platform, you're trying to do such big things. You should be held accountable for what, you're, what, you, what you say and what you do and what you tweet and who you call legally problematic things. Um, and he deserves that. I, and he deserves uh, the scrutiny. However, I... I I feel like many of you know the kind of person that this is, you know, the, the kind of just, you know, died in the wool nerd who got really rich, really famous, had some really great ideas, and he retains that, hmm, that, that je ne sais quoi, that uh, feeling like he's still the underdog, still the weird kid in school or class or something like that. And I will say, I will say this for him, that for everything weird and problematic that he's said and done, which he has said and done, 
I still believe that he does serve some kind of interesting function in society that uh, somebody does need to get the public excited about these things again. I mean, when he launched Starman, when he put his cherry Tesla Roadster uh, on, the <laughs> on top of a rocket and launched it, that was ridiculous. But how many people were talking about rockets? and space travel and what he was doing. I think it did invigorate the public in some way. Like the first time the SpaceX rocket landed itself. I mean, I've never seen, I have, in my lifetime, I haven't seen people as excited about space travel. So 420, should it be Elon Musk day? I, I don't know, but I think that he has done amazing things. And uh, I'm, I'm, I still keep an open mind about Elon Musk, even though he can be super into anime sometimes, which isn't bad. Let's go back to the chat. We're about halfway, halfway through our business here. Uh, see what people are saying. <laughs> Chef Smoke, uh, one of my uh, patrons as well, one of the originals, says, uh, "Geek life is for life." Well, yeah. I mean, but you, you you extend that out to everything. It's what's weird is that geek has this other stigma attached to it, where it's it feels more of a a choice to people where in my belief you're more drawn to geeky things because you are a geeky person and so for that you can extend it out to everything you know an ext extrovert life extrovert for life yeah no I know it's just your personality people don't change people don't change Uh, Bolwick, one of our Professor Emeritus at the facility, asks, um, Do you think humans would be able to continue to survive if uh, giant creatures such as Godzilla suddenly appeared? I'm pretty sure, well, you know, it, it's, a, it's a prevailing theory, but uh, I don't think that humans could have evolved into the apex species and predators that they are and, uh, and that they were in antiquity if there were still, like, velociraptors and T-Rex running around. You know, when humans first evolved, or, you know, Homo erectus first evolved and split off um, from Australopithecus, um, we wiped out all the megafauna everywhere, basically. You know, aside from, like, elephants and giraffes, there were, there were sloths the size of trees, like big trees. G search for a giant ground sloth, <laughs> a giant ground sloth. They were absolutely immense creatures. Uh, those woolly mammoths, we wiped all of these out. But these were grazers and herbivores. If you had something like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, 40 feet long, voracious, semi-warm blooded, sorry, the coffee here, the dark matter coffee here at the facility is crazy. Oh, it's semi-transparent. I gotta stop experimenting in here. <laughs> anyway. If you had megafauna that could fight back, I'm not sure that humans would be as successful as they were. And that's because of the KT extinction event, of course, 65 million years ago. If that didn't give uh, mammals and our ancestors an opportunity to evolve into the apex species that they are now, would they, would we be, would I be here with a braid broadcasting? I'm not so sure. Uh, Data Bing asks an interesting question. If parallel universes existed, what evidence would we find? Interesting question because I think that's one of the problems with the parallel universe idea is that it's, well, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, many respective quantum mechanists think that the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, that there are many worlds that split off every time a quantum event happens and there's infinite realities. Many of them think that that's true and that's the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics. Okay, fair. But if there's no way for these other worlds to ever interact, ever, and there's no tests and there's no evidence you could ever gather to prove that they existed, it's, it's hard to really make work um, in terms of uh, how useful is the theory. It doesn't explain anything. You can't test it. There's no experiments. Um, so I don't know. I, I, there's ideas of like bubble universes, universes separated in, in space, in space time that are like their own little bubbles of laws of physics and stuff, and you might be able to feel 
with instruments when they touch each other. But that's just a that's just a theory, a science theory. Dennis Smith says, "Hey Kyle, love the show." Feels good to hear that again, man. Hi Tooth uh, says, "Nice hair, dude. I woke up like this." Rune12358 says, Megafauna has nothing to do, uh, nothing to do against a social species. Nothing messes with ants, even us. They just carry on. Okay, fair enough. Ants are, there's almost as many ants as us, by weight. If they ever unionized against us. Whoo, man. Uh, Efficient Plasma, whose avatar is a picture of pl picture of plasma says uh, do you think aliens could exist yes it is my position that aliens do probably exist G just based on the sheer numbers you know a hundred billion planets in the average galaxy a hundred billion galaxies with most of those stars having planets around them maybe one two three four four planets around stars on average each one of them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions um so if even if, even if life, the chances of life being on a planet or existing, even if that was one in a trillion, you still have a number of, of planets in the universe that have life on it. The numbers are good. What's not good is the evidence that aliens have ever been here. Despite what people who are scared of 5G might tell you, there's no good evidence that aliens have ever been here. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But, for my money, Convince me that the most important meeting that has ever happened ever anywhere has happened. Give me good evidence. And if they can travel light years across the galaxy to, to meet us, I don't think they would just touch some farmer's butts. That's just me. What do I know? Fimon says, Kyle, could space whales exist? You asked this a number of times, so now I'm going to answer it so you can stop asking it. Uh, creatures living, living in space is hard, um, because space is basically the most, um, aggressive environment. There's no air, there's no pressure, there's no food, there's no water, there's nothing that could sustain life as we know it. So while there could be some sort of creature, I'm, maybe, you know, uh, what if, what if there is some kind of alien plant life that, that lives on a very, uh, low gravity asteroid, let's say. And as part of their reproductive process, they, they encase themselves in a hard shell, a very airtight, hermetic even. And inside of this, there is a yolk-like thing uh, that it could live off, it has its own nutrients. And then as part of its reproductive cycle, the plant, um, through a buildup of, of water pressure and elasticity, it, it shot itself up out of the low gravity well, the small gravity well, up out into space. And it had to reproduce by finding another a planet to impact or go onto. And it could survive for many, many years on the nutrients it had inside of itself, inside of its uh, airtight shell. If it could also, you know, if it also had the biology to protect itself against the cosmic radiation and stuff, I could see something like that existing, but with a, a space whale, something that's fleshy and needs water and air and has eyes and needs to breathe and stuff, much harder to do. So now, what are, what are we on to now? Climate change. That's always a fun topic, but I think it's especially important now. So many of you have been asking me in the light of current events, how is this affecting the planet? Uh, well, that's that's hard uh, to say. And uh, what's inarguable, though, is that emissions have certainly gone down. I, I know in cities like New York and Los Angeles, emissions have gone down like 30% based on the previous year. And that is incredible. But like we said in a previous episode, what we would really have to do to make a dent in climate change is something even more substantial than everyone being in quarantine and for many years. That's the scary part. What, what, what's really scary to me is that if we have such a hard time reacting to this crisis right now, 
and it's hard to react to it because our psychology, this, this crisis right now is slow moving, it's invisible, it's hard to feel immediately unless you know someone who's affected. And so it doesn't, it doesn't ring the same alarm bells for us. This is just like climate change. It's even slower moving, it's even harder to see, but it's critically, critically important. So what scares me is that if we have such an inability to react to this crisis, can we ever really react to a slow moving crisis like climate change adequately? And I wanna bring up a number that I saw. So according to the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, uh, fossil fuel use would have to decline by about 10% around the world in unison and then sustain for an entire year to show up at all in the climate change record. Now think about that for a second. We are decreasing, while we might be decreasing uh, emissions right now, because the climate and the atmosphere is such a huge system, I mean, it's just such a huge volume of air, we would have to make a consistent concerted effort lowering global emissions by a lot. And if we are only doing a little bit of this while the entire world is on lockdown, can we step up and make an even bigger change for an even bigger problem? I don't know. And keeping in mind that this is a dress rehearsal, we are lucky, we are very lucky that this is not as infectious as something like measles, that it's not as uh, deadly as something like Ebola. There's nothing in evolution that prevents that from happening. We really, really need to get this right because evolution's not going to stop. Eventually, there is going to be something that has no cure, that is incredibly transmissible, and that kills 60% of people. That would be the worst thing to happen to human, human civilization in this global society right now. So we better get this right. So let's get this right and then get climate change right and then go back to chat. What's everyone saying? Sorry, I was getting a little worked up. Uh, Prince Reinhardt asks, uh, fossil fuel includes coal and gas too, right? Not just less cars then. Yes. So we would we would want to, to really cut back on global carbon emissions, um, not just cars, but uh, coal-fired power plants. Sorry, not really the way we need to be doing things anymore. I know people are sensitive about their jobs, of course, everyone is, but outdated technology for the good of humanity, eh, sorry. Let's, let's give you an, a, a better job that's safer and cleaner and, and greener. Let's do that. Um, but also we'd want to reduce, you know, meat consumption, um, methane, even though there there's so many more cows than you think. And even though Relatively speaking, volume-wise, they don't fart all that much. Methane is four times more um, impactful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So when you have millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of heads of cattle all farting, and that gas is much, much, much more potent than carbon dioxide, it makes a big difference for climate change. So we would want to be reducing meat consumption, reducing meat consumption, uh, coal-fired power plants, uh, make all of our, uh, you know, factories and our power sources cleaner in general. And it is my opinion that we definitely need to switch very quickly and very heavily into nuclear power. It's one of those things where people have a phobia about it. And, and, I, and I, 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 uh, I heard this put in an amazing way. So obviously the first thing that people will say uh, about switching to nuclear power is that, what about Chernobyl? Okay, so there have been like three major nuclear disasters in our recent history. Okay. It is catastrophic, and it can render a amount of land inhabitable for hundreds of years, or decades even. Okay, that's bad. But based on how likely it is for something like that to happen where those are those are outdated designs now you know in the 60s and 70s and 80s they were built we could build much safer ones now so think about the cost benefit ratio this way 
Would we save more lives by switching to nuclear power sooner than we would losing them in any potential disaster? Coal and uh, coal pollution results in like more than a million deaths a year. Literally. More than cars, more than guns, more than... I mean, it's up there, it's, it's starting to get up there on a per, you know, per capita basis with like cardiovascular disease and stuff. So, if we all switch to nuclear power now, like something like France does or something like that, would the reduction in pollution lead to more saved lives than would ever be lost in a disaster? I don't know, think about it. It's my opinion that it would. Uh, Jigsaw Joe says, vote for Pedro. No. Make it count, man. This is, <laughs> if there's any time to not mess around with your vote. November. <laughs> Missing Wolf says, I made it. Hello. Hi. You're live. Uh, Punitive Abyss says, just eat bugs. Good point. I agree. Um, I, uh, recently I was on an episode, uh, over Thanksgiving on It's Okay to Be Smart, my friend Joe Hansen's channel, and he made an entire, well, his chefs made an entire Thanksgiving dinner using bugs, and what's incredible about eating insects is that you can, A, make them very tasty, but B, they have an incredible protein content per mass, much more so than something like beef or chicken, and they use much, much less resources to make the equivalent amount of protein, so they use for example, much less water to grow all those insects per kilogram of insect than it does per kilogram of beef. So if we could switch to, you know, cricket flour and um, uh, much more insectoid-based foods, it would make a big dent. And, and protein's good for you. Andrew Weir asks, not Andy Weir, I guess, of The Martian, but Andrew Weir. Last time I saw Andy Weir, he said, hey, thanks for making sure there's no frost giants around. That's all he said to me. Uh, Andy Weir, not the other, says, how is it that solar sails work? So solar sailing is sailing on sunlight. It's a very beautiful idea, um, most famously championed by Carl Sagan in the 80s, 70s and 80s. And what solar sails does, uh, do, uh -huh, is use a giant uh, sheet something very thin and very reflective, like mylar, a very shiny sheet. And what that does is very efficiently reflect photons, like a mirror, but you want it to be light. I mean, light in mass, not light in photons. So what a solar sail does is it reflects light from the sun back towards the sun. Now light doesn't, uh, photons of light do not have any mass, but they do have momentum. Thanks to the speed of light, uh, they do have momentum. So when a photon of light gets reflected on this very light spacecraft, what it does is it imparts some of that momentum when it reflects. So if this is stationary, it goes a uh, little bit. And you can imagine photons coming in constantly from the sun. Now this is a, an absolutely minuscule amount of thrust, like nothing. Like you could push on one of these solar sails with your finger much harder than the sun does. But because there's no fuel, you don't need any fuel for this, nothing like a, you know, a Saturn V rocket or anything, this sunlight can press on the solar sail for weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years, and eventually, because it's not slowing down at all, there's no air and space or resistance in space to slow it down, nothing like friction or drag. Well, there's some kind of drag, but whatever. There's no like air drag this uh, small acceleration over months or years can uh, make a solar sail, sail build up immense speed. So uh, to answer your question, Mr. Weir, solar sails sail on sunlight using tiny, tiny uh, Im uh, imparting of momentum to the sail to build up a huge velocity over time. And uh, uh, the Planetary Society, Bill Nye's Planetary Society, which was Carl Sagan's initially, well, he was one of the founding members. Um, now Bill Nye's the CEO, but uh, they just launched one. And I think they're gonna either they, they might, I think they have another launch coming up on SpaceX actually, with a Falcon Heavy. Yeah, Senpai noticed you. It's almost like this is live. So.
We talked about that. But not about this. 5G. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm getting ready. Okay, so 5G. This is a new kind of cellular, not new kind, it's an upgrade to the cellular network that uh, utilizes more bandwidths available, even in like the really small bandwidths, like millimeter uh, size bandwidths. And um, it's an upgrade to 4G and it's being installed all over the world and uh, providers are, are buying into it. And uh, to, give you a con to give you context, like uh, 5G can have like gigabyte upload download speeds. It can support, I think it can support a million devices per cell that it covers versus a hundred thousand. So like an order of magnitude more coverage and it's much, much faster and it's being installed all over the world. What is it? about 5G that makes people so crazy. Now, the conspiratorial mindset is a weird one. When you are a conspiracy theorist, and everyone, and I'm not meaning to denigrate anyone, we all have our own flavors. We're on the spectrum of conspiracy, what we're willing to believe, what we're willing to not believe, who we listen to, who we don't listen to. It's just on the fringe where you really get the fringe views, of course. Why 5G? Well. In line with many other conspiracy theories, in my mind, there's no, there's not a lot of research on this. This is me speculating. But it has to do with government, power, authority, control, lack of visibility. So what's, what, what, what can be, what, what can trigger some of these uh, conspiracy theories? Well, in my mind, I think it's, well, you have people from the government installing something that you don't understand near your home. You have the same, uh, you have the same uh, problematic uh, views about um, power lines and wind farms and all this stuff. What does it do? Then you have an inherent distrust of authority. And so when people are coming in saying, this is better for you, the conspiratorial mindset is reactionary and says, you don't know, you don't know nothing. What are you, from AT&T? <laughs> The next big, big component, I think, is that it's invisible. So if this was, if this was, you know, if you could see the radiation being shot out from 5G cell towers, I think you'd, you, you would, you have more of an intuitive understanding of, oh, that thing is doing that thing. But because it's invisible and because it has the word radiation attached to it, your mind has this void left to insert your own ideas about what radiation actually does. and. From the 40s to the 50s, when you know nuclear power uh, and nuclear bombs are coming online and radiation, how it's scary. I think this invisibleness of this potential problem has always been with us, and I think that's pretty rational to be afraid of something you can't see. But we do have studies on these kinds of things. So radiation comes in a number of flavors. The radiation that you're using to see me, wherever you're looking at me right now, is in the visible bandwidth. Uh, we communicate with radio waves that have uh, less energy, longer wavelengths. You get up further uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, the wavelengths uh, decrease and they gain energy and they get very, very strong. Energy in the X-ray range, the gamma ray range, is what's called ionizing radiation. So it can make atoms and molecules ions. It can, it can hit something so hard in a molecule that the molecule's electrons fly off. And when it becomes an ion, it has a partial charge to it, and that can change how it functions within your body, for example. You, you smash enough of your DNA with ionizing radiation, your DNA doesn't work the same because parts of it are missing, and then mutations can happen and cancer can happen, and that's what happens with terrible radiation accidents, like Chernobyl. But, where we have to ask ourselves now, what flavor of radiation is 5G? What kinds of radiation are these uh, cell phone towers your cell phone putting out? Well, the cell phone thing has been studied for so long now, Acro uh, across decades of people, across tens of thousands of people for many years. Um, and what we know from the physics is that the kind of the flavor of radiation that is 5g that is cell phone radiation is non-ionizing radiation this is uncontroversial this is just the physics it literally does not have the energy like microwave bandwidth energy it does not have the energy to knock off parts of your dna and your cells and make them function weird 
you can hold a cell phone up to your head and take many phone calls for many years, and on average, we do not find any statistical increase in something like brain cancer. We just don't. So the likelihood that an upgrade to the capacity of a network, the likelihood that it's now suddenly using some kind of radiation that is harmful to us is very low. And we'd be able to see that in the epidemiology very quickly. Now, people have been trying to link the epidemiology to clusters. Oh, people have been getting, have been getting sick around where they're putting up these cell towers. This is coincidence. There just happen to be a lot of people where you'd want to put cell phone towers to serve a lot of people. And so when there's a crisis like this around, yes, of course, highly densi high density areas where people are getting sick are also going to probably have a lot of cell phone towers. That's coincidence. That's, that's correlation. But what the conspiratorial mindset forgets is causation. The causation part would, be co would come from some kind of uh, physics, the radiation damage. But does it damage our bodies in this way? No. Now, the fact that this has been linked to the current crisis is wild. And I think this is more of, I think it's very natural for us to want some kind of silver bullet. That's the smoking gun. That is what's causing it. That's making it bad. If we could only destroy these, people have been lighting some of these 5G cell phone towers on fire. If we could only destroy it and control it, it would make everything better. The fact of the matter is, the only real way we can make things better right now is exactly what we're doing, by staying away from each other. It's not gonna be 5G. And we need, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a counterfactual here. This is not true, what I'm about to say. This is not true. Don't take me out of context. But even if 5G had something to do with what's going on right now, and everyone shut down all the cell phone towers, like, oh crap, that didn't work at all. It made it worse. The loss of life that would result from people not being able to communicate and coordinate with each other on a global scale would probably be more than what that is supposed to be doing. So from a counterfactual point of view and a physics point of view, obviously the link between 5G and something harmful to your body doesn't make any sense. We can study it, sure, but previous research would indicate that might be a waste of time. <sighs> I could use some fresh air. Oh, man, a lot nicer, a lot nicer out here. Let's see what the chat has to say. Brian Fernandez says, why are you a villain? How dare you? There's nothing about me or my life that indicates that I could be a villain. What, you mean, you mean Lola over there? No, she's cool. Jamie Vanderheuvel says, would you ever create a Magic the Gathering slash Commander content? Love the show. I absolutely would, but right now I kind of have my hands full doing the whole science thing. What I would love to do is uh, go back on the command zone and play more with those boys. Um, obviously because of the situation right now, we're not playing, but uh, we used to play probably once or twice a month. Um, and they're, they're wonderful guys, so I would love to go back on the command zone. Crunson2000 says, your backyard is looking a little junked up. Well, your backyard would be junked up too if you tried to build hyper-efficient motors and engines and stuff, and then you had, oh, I don't know, huge beasts stomping around? Man, come on. Lola is a good girl, Chef. Thank you. Not in the know says, with 5G here now, how far are we realistically from teleportation? So far. We are so far away from teleportation. I, I think I think that sci-fi stories 
kind of uh, have made teleportation seem something like something easy. And that's fine. That's what the story is trying to do. It's trying to make teleportation just a mechanic that they use to tell a story. And so they make it seem easy because they have to. That's cool. I'm fine with that. However, think about what you would have to do to make teleportation real. I mean, the only the only really logical way I've heard it explained was that a computer would have to precisely determine the position, momentum, and velocity, which we can't do right now because of quantum mechanics. You know, uh, the we all of all of the data for every single atom in your body. Because when you are teleported to another place, you want everything to be in the right place, obviously. But let's say that the atoms in your brain aren't placed back in a similar way. Then you're not you anymore. Uh-oh. So how much data would it take to digitize all that information? So, so much. So, I did this in an episode once, but it would take so, so much information just for one person. Um, like, exabytes of data. And then on top of that, you have to have a machine that actually takes apart a person atom by atom and then can recombine that person atom by atom. I have no idea how that would happen. I honestly don't. I've never heard a, I've never heard a good theory for it. So, uh, right now I think teleportation is way far away. <sighs> oh, it's nice to get outside, you know? Notice that I am six feet away from Lola at the moment. Mr. Diglett says, sneaking around work and trying to watch this live, worth the risk. Well, you could always use Dig and then run away if they find you. Ron Me 100 says, it always looks like you're squatting. Yeah, dude. How you, are you not working out at home? I'm squatting constantly. Gotta work them buns, hun. <laughs> Adam Evans says, where is the sky? It is a fun question. I agree with you, Adam. But if you want to be technical about it, well, I mean, there's no, what's fun is that there's no actual edge of the sky. The sky is a gradient of, of gases slowly, most of the gases in our atmosphere being compelled to stay close to the planet because of gravity. But it, it, uh, the density of the gas gets wispy, 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 wispy until it's basically the pressure of that gas is indistinguishable from the pressure of space. But it goes down from like zero pressure and then on a full gradient all the way down to atmospheric pressure. So there's no hard edge of pressure of how much gas is in a certain volume. But we, as humans, we arbitrarily decided the point at which the pressure of the gas is indistinguishable from the pressure of space, we call that where the sky ends. And that is uh, called the Kármán line and it's 62 miles or 100 kilometers up off of the average surface of the planet. Now we have a few more minutes here, so let's take just a couple more chat quit. See, Lola, you be a good girl, yeah? Oh, good girl. Hey, there you are. So just a couple more, let's do a couple more. <laughs> My security team is deleting messages that say I'm not the proper size for stuff. Are you kidding me? You don't know how big I am. I'm I'm small. I'm large. You don't know. Plus, all the all the scaling in the facility is really weird because we have to accommodate a lot of different humanoid forms. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh. Krin Firelight asks, can we make dragons? From what? There, there, there is research going on right now. The guy who uh, the main character in Jurassic Park is based on is actually doing research in, in uh, biological research to try to make something like a chickenosaurus. So uh, chickens and birds are dinosaurs. In fact, uh, there's, there's so much so dinosaurs that we have to call uh, other dinosaurs non-avian dinosaurs, so non-bird dinosaurs. But Birds are dinosaurs, modern birds are dinosaurs, and you can see that inside of their DNA. So there's certain um, genes and code that has been switched off by evolution that has made them less dinosaur-like and more bird-like. 
less feathers and teeth. I mean, less scales and teeth, more feathers and beaks. So there's some research going on to create a chickenosaurus, and you can look into this, where uh, they're trying to go into a chicken embryo where uh, the, the body is being told what to do by the genetic information. So what if we went into, before it, may, before it acted on, on that blueprint, what if we went in and changed the blueprint a little bit and flicked back on the dinosaur switches? So they've been trying some of this, and they've been able to give chickens teeth in the embryo form. And you call me a supervillain. But uh, it's, it's a chickenosaurus kind of idea where what if we could go back in the lineage, the genetic lineage, not Assassin's Creed style because that doesn't make any sense, but like the genetic lineage of, an, of a creature and flick back on some of these switches to give it more ancestral traits. And so making a dragon, I suppose, would be closer to taking a modern bird and flicking some of those switches to make it more dinosaur-like. In terms of dragon as a flying thing, wings aren't big enough. Muscles aren't big enough. Uh, the biggest, like, flying thing, uh, oh, I can't, Quetzalcoatl? No, that's not the name of it. Anyway, it's a giant stork-looking thing with huge, huge wings. <laughs> but even that, I, I forget, I forget the name of it. Now I sound dumb. But it, it's, it's, it's absolutely gigantic. It's, its shoulders are, like, twice as tall as you are off the ground. So it's, it's an absolutely ginormous creature, but even that isn't as big as, like, a dragon is. Something like, uh, uh, Tyrannosaurian, like 40 feet long. Let's do, let's do maybe one more. <laughs> oh, everyone's, everyone, don't, don't butt heads with security. I'm telling you. Quetzalcoatlus. Thank you, Taiga. Yes, Quetzalcoatlus, if you want to look it up, is the creature. Okay, so... Wow, we talked about a lot. Let's recap for a second. 5G, it's because of its invisibility... The fact that it's tied in with government and corporations, I think it, it activates the conspiratorial mindset uh, to make people fear it. But we know from physics and epidemiology, uh, epidemiology, it's a hard word to say. I've been saying it a lot these days, though. That 5G is not the terrible spreading plague that some people may think it is. We also talked about climate change. Are we up for it? I really hope so. I hope you're up for it because what we're doing right now for this current crisis, we're going to have to do something even more substantial over an even longer time. But I believe in us. We also talked about Elon Musk. For all his faults, he has, he has many and he got sued a couple times. But I still do think that if 420 has to be Elon Musk day and get people excited about space, renewable technology, heck, I want a Tesla. So be it. You nerds. We also talked about Godzilla. If you haven't checked out the latest video up on this channel, all about Godzilla, all the science, please go do so. Uh, it has been, it's with Magic the Gathering, my favorite game in the world. And we worked really hard on it. We even got a new wing of the facility that I'm really, really happy about. So please check out that video. And we also talked about the longest animal on Earth, 180 feet long, a bootlace thing that looks like a pile of guts that has mucus that smells like raw sewage and kills cockroaches. Wow. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Office Hours. If you want to join me afterwards as well, you can go to patreon.com slash kylehill and you can join the Patreon and our Discord where right now literally hundreds of nerds are giving me episode ideas, they're sharing pictures of their pets, they're setting up their own game nights and their own uh, Dungeons and Dragons nights, they're giving me episode ideas. I talk on the Discord pretty much, pretty much more than any other creator you've ever seen on Patreon. I'm gonna say it. So if you want to talk to me, see behind the scenes stuff, why there's blood on one of my gloves over there, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. Uh, there'll be another episode of Office Hours next week. Please go watch the video that we just put up about an hour ago. I hope everyone has uh, a wonderful rest of their week. Stay healthy, stay safe, um, and uh, be nice to each other. 
even if it's not a handshake or a hug or a kiss or anything like that, be nice to each other as best you can because this is all we got, you know?